Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lucian. Um, thank you all so much for attending my dissertation defense today, especially thanks to my amazing dissertation committee. Uh, my advisor, Professor Amisha, Professor Tiki Prasad, Professor Kuka Chen, Dr. Ingma Weber from Qatar Computing Research in Institute, and Dr. Justin Martinu from Samsung Research America. So the title of my dissertation is Mining and Analyzing Subject Exper Experiences in User-Generated Content. In our case, we were taught how to differentiate between objective reality and subject experiences. Subjective experiences are the things that exist in our minds, such as perception of time, music preference, taste of ice cream, feelings about happiness or pain. Accordingly, uh, the information can also be divided into two categories, object information or facts and subject information. There are many ways to collect subject information, such as we talk to our friends and family to ask about their thoughts, feelings. Companies, they collect customers' opinions on their products and services through surveys, questionnaires, or focus groups. Pulling organizations like Gallup or Pew Research Center, they uh, collect public opinions on a wide variety of topics through surveys. 5.2.0 gives us a convenient way to share our subject experiences. Uh, a large amount of information contain the um, uh, our thoughts and feelings. We can find this kind of information in user-generated content, such as reviews on Amazon, our opinions about election candidates on Twitter, our feelings and emotions on all the other uh, social media platforms. These subject information can be used to support better decision-making process such as we can use this information about uh, the opinion about uh, the, these election candidates we collect from Twitter to predict election results. Or we can make a purchase decision based on reading the reviews from Amazon. Or we can improve the target's uh, uh, advertisement based on the user's preference, intent. We can also use this information to monitor the social phenomena such as subject well-being. So there are different types of subject, subjective information. However, the current uh, subjectivity and sentiment analysis has largely focused on classifying the polarity of text to positive, negative, or neutral. So the other types of subject information, such as intent, preference, expectation, has not been taken into account, or taken as the same as the object as sentiment. Let's look at these following examples. They are all uh, uh, subjective information about the movie, The Secret Life of Pets. Would like to watch The Secret Life of Pets. I hope it's good. Using the current sentiment analysis technique, it will be classified as uh, positive. However, we can say intent and expectation in this. <coughs> Would like to watch means the uh, express user's intent to watch this movie. And I hope it's good. It's an um, optimistic uh, expectation to this movie. And from the second one, the sick life of past was clever, adorable, funny. This is the sentiment and opinion about this movie. I already want to see it again. It's the intent. And uh, next, a third example. I don't think watch the sick life uh, of past makes me childish. That is opinion about this movie. And then I laughed, I cried, and it was so touching for someone who has a pet like me. So laughed, cried, and touching, they express the emotions that can be caused by this by watching this uh, uh, movie. And next one. In the next one, it compares three movies, Fighting Dory, The Secret of Pets, and Zootopia. It expresses uh, people, uh, this user's uh, preference among these three movies. And the last one. The last one uh, expressed a positive opinion about the soundtrack of this movie. So from these examples, we can see there are different types of subject formation, but they are now has been largely ignored, except the sentiment opinion. So that's why uh, in this dissertation, I first um, propose a, a unified framework about this uh, subject formation. We define a subject experience as a culpable, which contains four elements. A holder, which is an individual who holds this experience, is usually the author of the post. And as, as a stimulus or target 
of this experience. What are the other examples you've seen where the holder is not the author? News articles. Mm. In news articles, people, uh, the, the journalists usually express like opinions about if like, they interview others. So, okay. in, in news articles, the holders is a holder extraction is a problem. Mm. So. The stimulus um, can be an entity, event, or situation which cause or elicit this experience. Like the movie, the Sick Life Pets. And E, E represents a set of expressions that used to describe this, this, this experience, such as sentiment, words or phrases, or opinion claims. Or like if we want to express any intent, we usually use some uh, expression about belief or desire. And the last element uh, is the classification or assessment that categorizes or measures the experience. So this classification or assessment usually depend on not only the uh, type of subject formation, it also depends on the application itself. Like uh, for sentiment analysis, sometimes we classify the sentiment in text into positive, negative, neutral three categories. But sometimes we want to assess the strength of the sentiment, like weak, strong, medium. Using this framework, so now we can uh, formulate the, uh, the problem of extraction of subject information into a data mining task which aims at extracting four components from textual content. If you look at these examples again, from all these examples for all types of subject information, we can extract their holders, stimulus, expressions, and classification. Uh, because in all these examples, the holders are the authors of the messages. So, but they have different stimulus or expressions. Like for the first, first one, so, for the intent, the stimulus is really an action, like watching the movie. The expressions uh, is about desire, or will, would like to. So, for intent, uh, we have different uh, classification scheme. So, in this case, we may classify this as a transactional intent, instead of information seeking, because just people want, may, may want to buy the tickets to watch this movie. And for the expectation, so hope is good means this user has a optimistic expectation. So generally, we can classify expectation to optimistic or pessimistic. So again, for the second one, for sentiment, we can extract the stimulus as the movie itself and then expression and classify it as positive. Again, for the intent, we can uh, extract uh, these four components. So let's look at this example. So fighting Dory is much better than the secret pets, still not as good as Utopia though. So preference can be seen as a special case of sentiment. However, the target is preference, preference is really a set of options. So user express or compare among these uh, options and show the preference. So the stimulus will be a set of options and expressions be uh, some um, expression about the comparison. And the last one is opinion. So the student, the here the stimulus is the soundtrack of the movie instead of the movie itself. And then um, here is an overview of the subject. So the opinion is about Oscar. Is that uh, you know that we should get an Oscar? Is that something uh, that is identified in terms of the entity? It should be identified that this is about Oscar. How many, suppose I want to be able to ask, how many people uh, believe, uh, feel that this uh, soundtrack should be nominated for Oscar? Yes, so, but for that, I will have to do some uh, more specific analysis of the expression. Mm. Like whether in the expression it mentions any entity. Mm. And here the target is still the, the soundtrack. Oh, I, I actually I want to mention one thing. So. Many people may uh, feel confused about the difference between sentiment and opinion. So opinion can be, can, so sentiment really have an emotional tone, like being classified as positive or negative. But however, for, for opinion, opinion can, doesn't have to contain an emotional tone. Like, it's kind of an uh, interpretation of information. Like, maybe I will say, uh, it's like rain today. So it's my opinion. But it's not, like, we cannot say it's positive or negative. It doesn't contain an emotional tone. So here is the overview of the um, uh, subject information extraction. So first, we collect user-generated content from all different social media platforms. 
And then there are uh, several processing steps can be applied to the raw data, like uh, sentence splitting, uh, word organization, uh, part of, uh, to extract the part of text, etc. And then uh, an optional step is to detect subject information or subject content from the text. It can include a classification task which classify the text as subjective or objective. It can also include some <coughs> classifiers to detect which specific subject information contained in the text, like whether it's an intent, expectation, or sentiment. I say it's um, optional because sometimes we know what we are looking for in the text. Like we know we are looking for sentiment, or we know we are looking for intent. So in that case, we may skip this um, step. And then the main step is to extract information. For different types of uh, self-information, like sentiment, opinion, emotion, intent, they may have uh, they may need different techniques to extract these four components. For example, for sentiment, sentiment is the target usually an entity, like the movie, or a brand, or person. So we need uh, entity recognition techniques to identify the target. However, for intent, so intent usually the stimulus is the action, action the user bound to perform in the future. So we need techniques to extract, identify the uh, action, a future action in the text. For expression, like for sentiment, to extract sentiment words or phrases. But for intent, we have to find in the text what is the expression about desire or belief in the future. And then for the classification, again, as I just mentioned, so it depends not only on the type of um, information, it also depends on the application itself. So. If you look at the intent, right? So for query intent, if I identify what is the uh, intent in query, we may identify like uh, transactional, uh, navigational, informational. But if we only, for some other cases, we may want to identify whether the user expresses any, any purchase intent in the text. Then we classify as purchase intent or not purchase intent. So it depends on the task. After we extract these uh, four components, the holder, target, expression, and classification. This information can be used to support different types of locations, um, like uh, marketing, improved marketing strategy, uh, improved online advertisements, predicting election results, or financial performance of a company. So, oh, actually, in this in this uh, figure, you can see this uh, orange box labeled the, the the work that ha I have focused on in this dissertation. So, let's uh, take a closer look to this. So in this dissertation, uh, in my research, I largely focus on three types of uh, self-information, sentiment, opinion, and emotion. And my research has covered all, the, uh, all these four components, expression, stimulus, classification, and holder. So today I'm going to go back to the first work, that is extraction of target specific sentence expressions. Um, so in this work, I uh, developed some algorithm which extract sentence expressions from social media posts. And the second work is about discovering the opinion targets from product reviews. So in product reviews, the, the opinion targets is the product features and aspects. And then I will briefly summarize two applications. In these two applications, I explore the techniques to ex extract some information to support uh, the election prediction and the uh, uh, investigation of the uh, relationship between religiosity and happiness. So other than this dissertation work, in the last few years, I have also participated in many emotion identification work, but it's not covered in the dissertation. Oh, here is the sixth statement. So it's also uh, summarized the contribution of my work. So this dissertation presents a unified framework that characterizes a subject experience, such as sentiment, emotion, opinion, in a, as a quadruple. Uh, which contains an individual who holds it, target, a set of expressions, and a classificational assessment. And then I propose new algorithms that automatically identify and extract sentiment expressions and opinion targets from user-generated content with minimal super, uh, human supervision. These, both of these methods doesn't, uh, do, do not require any labeling effort. And this dissertation also shows how to use social media data to support the uh, prediction of election results and uh, investigating religion and uh, spiritual well-being. 
by classifying and assessing the subject information from social media content. Okay. So now let's move on to the first work. I want to show an application scenario first. From all different social media platforms like um, Twitter or Facebook, we can collect users' posts or messages. These Posts and messages may talk about a wide variety of topics like movies, brands, celebrities. Like in this, uh, it's a small sample of examples. Lights Out definitely live up to the hype. Great movie. It's a sentiment about the movie, Lights Out. And then maybe look at the fourth one. I find myself grateful that Hillary Clinton is predictable and steady. Like her or don't, she's safe. So it's opinion, positive opinion about uh, Hillary Clinton. So from this kind of content, we can identify, we can do some synthesis and identify like for all these different, different target entities. We can identify what is percentage of positive, negative, or neutral opinions regarding each of them. And based on the results of synthesis, we can build predict models for, use this for business analytics or predicting financial performance or predicting black results. Like, uh, we have the opinions about these candidates, like Hillary Clinton, and then we use that to predict like results. Or, like, they have, like, opinions about the car uh, about some um, Galaxy S7 Edge. So we can use this kind of opinion to predict the stock market or the financial performance of, of a company. Okay, so this study is focused on extraction of target specific interactions. So this uh, extraction of sentiment interactions is a crucial component to support sentiment analysis. Uh, to be specific, I explore a problem that given a set of unlabeled social media posts, how to extract diverse form of, forms of sentiment expressions from unlabeled um, with respect to a specific target like movie or person. So this paper was published on STEPS in uh, 2012. So, from this, given this input, so I, uh, I developed some uh, algorithm that can uh, extract this kind of expressions. Leave up to the hype. Great. They are positive expressions regarding movie, like regarding the movie. And uh, maybe for the first one, I found it's a grateful, predictable, steady, and safe. They are positive um, sentiment regarding the election candidate. But however, if you look at the, for, uh, the fifth one, saw the Avengers last night. Mad, overrated, cheesy lies, and horrible writing. Very predictable. So here, the predictable, all, all the expressions are negative regarding the movie. But if we compare the fourth one and the fifth one, we will see the predictable can be positive regarding election candidate, but negative regarding the movie. It gives us a feeling that um, the polarity of a, of, the, of a word is dependent on the target. The same the same example is the word long. So the long in the example six, the long is negative regarding the movie. However, in, in example seven, Galaxy says a seven edge battery life lasts so long. So here the long is, is positive regarding the cell phone battery life. So these examples show clearly the challenges of this task. So first, same directions can be very diverse. But let's say these uh, single words or multi words phrases here in these examples. And also it can turn, maybe can turn like slang words like stupid. And then the polarity of sentence expression is sensitive to its target, like the word predictable or long. The contribution of this work is that we propose a noble optimization based approach that identifies diverse forms of sentence expressions, including uh, formal and slang expressions, words or phrases. It assesses the target dependent polarity of each expression, and it does not require label data or handcrafted uh, graphic patterns. This proposed approach takes three steps. In the but, first, but it does require uh, the seed elements. Yes, which are, no. yes, the seed. That's why I didn't mention the seed. Yes. So it takes three steps. So in the first step, we extract some candidate candidate expressions, and then we connect these kind of expressions using their inter-expression relations. So the inter-expression relations are two types, uh, consistent or inconsistent. Consistent means like these two candidates' expressions, they 
express the same polarity. So inconsistent means they, uh, they indicate uh, opposite polarity. And then the last step is to assess the target even polarity. In order to extract candidate expressions, we first build a large subjective lexicon. We first collect subjective words from MPQA, Center WordNet, all these um, lexical resource, sentiment lexical resources. However, we want to cover all those also slang words. So we developed a propagation algorithm to identify slang sentiment word from Urban Dictionary. So it's covered in my paper, so if you're interested, you can read the paper. After we build this subjectivity lexicon, we use that to support to support the on-target subject words from the social media posts. Like in this example, uh, we find bloody amazing cheesy light. They are the on-target subject words. On-target means these examples act upon the target, the Avengers. We use both the dependency relations and the proximity between the target word and the Subject word to identify whether these words are on target or not. After that, we extract the n grams from unigram to five gram, um, which contains at least one on target subject word as candidates. And then, after uh, identify these candidates, we extract their relations. Like for from the first example, it was long, but it was very good. So you see, there's a bat which means long and very good, they indicate opposite. Uh, we don't know which one is positive, which one is negative, but from here we know they indicate opposite uh, sentiment. So that's why we connect them with an uh, inconsistency relation. So by bounds you detect the uh, opposite? Yeah, all the words like that, like though, although, right. So, and the second one, I do enjoy the Avengers, but it both overrated and problematic. So from this one, we know enjoy is inconsistent with over, overrated and problematic. However, the overrated and problematic, these two should indicate the consistent uh, sentiment. So in this way, we connect all these candidates in this network. And we can also estimate the strength of connection based on the frequency of occurrence of two candidates in a consist as a consistent relation or inconsistent relation. So aside the weight, to all the connections. And the next step, we want to uh, assess the target uh, dependent polarity. So the, the intuitive idea is that we actually can have a small set of um, seed sentiment words. The polarity of these words are usually domain independent. The word like good or excellent or worst. So we know like in most cases they're positive or in most cases they're negative. So if we, we know the polarity of these small set of seed words, like good. Now how we can estimate the others? Because good and very good, they are consistent. So if good is positive, then very good is likely to be positive. Then long is likely to be negative. So in this way, the sentiment can be propagated in the network. But how to uh, model this intuitive idea? The model is as an optimization, optimization problem. So we first define two probability. The P probability is the probability that a candidate expression CI indicates positive sentiment. And N probability is probably that the CI indicates negative sentiment. The sum of them is one, because it can be either positive or negative. And then, based on the P and N probability of each candidate, we can estimate or calculate their consistency or inconsistency probability. Like, if both of CI and CJ are positive, or both CI and CJ are negative, that is their consistent um, consistent probability. So if one is positive, the other one is negative, then that is their inconsistent, inconsistent probability. The sum of them is also one. On a specific target? Yes, yes, yes. So if you assume that we know the P and N probability of a candidate, actually we only need to know the P probability, because N probability is just one minus that one, right? So that is something we want to estimate, but how to estimate that? We have network. So network carried information from about the target because the network was extract, uh, extracted from the target dependent, target specific coppers. Like we have coppers about movies. So we extract the candidates and connect them. So all these connections and um, uh, candidates carry the domain information. We have that network. And then we have the connection strengths. Here we use the weight 
to, uh, to represent the strength in the network. Now we just need to minimize the error between what we can estimate it using a PNN probability and what we can observe from the network. So here is just the try to minimize the error between the network and what we can estimate using a PNN probability. So eventually this, um, this uh, object function can be can have only uh, one um, variable, which is the p probability of each candidate. Because using the p probability, we can repress all these other probabilities. And uh, we solve this organization problem, um, we can get like the probability of each indicate to be positive or negative. And based on that, we can set a threshold, like if the p probability is higher than 0 0.6, then it's positive. If n probability is higher than uh, 0 0.6, then it's negative. So, so this is how we assign the uh, polarity uh, to each uh, expression. And then we conduct experiments on five different data sets. Two Twitter data sets, one talk about movie, the other one talk about person. So if we observe these five data sets, we can see that for Twitter data set, it usually contains only one or two sentences. And these sentences are short. However, for the other three, follow my Facebook posts, we can say, that like they, they can do a lot of sentences in each post. And the, the sentence can be very long, like the example shown here. So this, we have the epilepsy forum post, which, uh, which is a forum post about the epilepsy, epilepsy treatment. And also we have a forum post about a cellular company and about the Facebook public post about the automobile uh, company. So we have these five data sets. But because they are very different, so we um, first conduct experiments on Twitter data set and then study experiments on the, the other three. We collect a large amount of tweets about movies and persons and uh, randomly sampled 1,500 tweets and label them to build a gold standard. And in these two tables, we show the diversity of the expression. From this one, we can see that from the gold standard, the expression is like more than 50% in movie domain or 70% in person domain, they are single words. But it can also be uh, phrases, contain different numbers of words. And uh, the part of speech, half of them can be adjective, but can also be verbs or nouns. So regarding the tweet, the tweet will also label as positive or negative. You can see more than 50% of them are uh, objective, actually, they're not subjective. However, among the subjective ones, the positive sentiment it's much more than negative ones. <laughs> we named our method as COM. It stands for a constraint optimization model. And uh, because we have different ways to initialize the initial value of the P probability of each candidate, we have two ways. The first way, you can just assign 0 0.5 to all the candidates as their P probability. Or we can, uh, based on the subjective lexicon we created before, to um, assign the P probability of each candidate. We compare these two methods with uh, four baselines. The first three baselines are based on the MPQA, general imperial, semi warnet lexicon. And this one is a propagation approach. So we, we, we first evaluate all the methods on the task of extracting sentence expressions. So if you look at the right, right chart, okay. So both of our, the versions of our method, they achieve higher precision requirement of measure compared with other four baselines. The com seems the variations, if you compare two variations, we see com cons is better on, uh, uh, in terms of precision, but com back galaxy in ter uh, is uh, better in terms of recall. But overall, the com cons is still better. And then we apply the extracted sentiment expressions by all, the, uh, all these methods to classify the tweets as positive, negative, neutral, or objective. So it's not binary classification, it's like uh, have four classes. So here is the results. They ca oh, actually ca calculate the macro average F measure. So if you look at here, still using the extraction extracted by the proposed method, still achieve better results compared with other baselines. Which classifier? Oh, sorry? Oh, it, it's just like a lexicon based classifier. Like you just count like uh, how many past expressions or next expressions appear in the tweet. So it's like more positive than negative, and it's like positive. So it's simply based on the expression extracted. So this result has demonstrated the um, advantage of our approach. 
And then because we collected a lot of tweets, so I would say what is the size of corpus can affect the performance. So we increased the tweet corpus from 1500 to 48,000. We still use the same gold standard, so the precision might be um, not that uh, not exactly the precision, but but it's like it still can show the trend. So we can see that uh, the top two lines, the, the precision recovery top two lines are our approach. Here is also the yeah, top two lines are our approach. We compare both their recall precision curve and the F measure. So we still can see that first our approach is always above the other approach, and also. When we increase the coppers from 12,000 to uh, 48,000, we even can see the increase of both precision recall and that measure. So it's because our approach can benefit from more relations extracted from larger copper. Okay? Given larger copper, the strength of the uh, connection between two candidates can be more accurate because we have more evidence. And then we also um, conduct experiments on the other social media posts. So we collect this number of uh, forum posts uh, about eclipse treatment, cellular company, and the Facebook posts about automobile company. And then we create this gold standard um, by human annotation. Here, if we, if we look at the, in the gold standard, what, what is distribution of um, uh, sentiment expressions, we find that only less than 20% of same expressions are single words. If you still remember the Twitter data set, there are more than 50 or even 70, 70 percent that single words. It indicates the importance to identify the multi-words phrases for this kind of data. But it's also indicate that this could be very challenging. And then so the other intrinsically <laughs> The number of multi-word phrases will be far more than the single word, yes. right? Yes. So what issues does it uh, present in the context of the uh, <clears throat> size of corpora, number of notations, support it takes, computation, variety of other things like that? So so let's look at the example here. So if you only look at the example here, right, about the epilepsy treatment, it is really difficult. To, even when the human and experts annotate data, they find it's very difficult. So we assume that the treatment has been labeled as target, right? So like for these medications or treatment, so we have identified reducing the frequency and the intensity of his seizures is a positive expression about the treatment. You can never identify only seizures or reducing. Reducing some, because you don't know, reducing what, right? Reducing the drug, a, a dose or what. So you have identified all of them. So it's ex extremely hard. Oh, that's fine. So, so now, what right. is the intuition? Why? Uh, what did you do to make it uh, more manageable to get what you want? Why? Why? What? What, what is it that you did differently and uniquely if, compared to your predecessors that allowed you to get what you want? What so is the intuition? So most system now for lexicon uh, to uh, construct the lexicon sentiment lexicons, they only focus on sentiment, sentiment uh, single words. Not even cover slums, only formal sentiment words. Maybe they can cover like feel, frequency, intensity, scissor, but then it cannot capture multi words phrases. So at this one, uh, as far as I know, is the first work that can identify multi words fra uh, phrases as sentiment expression. So because we didn't really use any patterns to identify the candidate, we just extract the engrams that can cover at least one subject word, right? And then we build network trying to use whatever information in the text to see whether these two expressions can be consistent or inconsistent and apply the optimistic model to identify their um, polarity. So I think the strength of the method is that, first, we didn't use patterns, so we can cover diverse form of expressions. And second, we didn't really use any like uh, general semantic similarity. Uh, we didn't use any general polarity. Like, if we know the scissors is positive negative, if the center is really negative as a single word, but in this whole phrase is positive, the whole phrase is positive. So for the current approach, it didn't consider it as a phrase as to identify the polarity as a whole. So our approach can do this. So, so how did you delimit the phrase is the question. So did you use the syntax to basically guide you to the process? Yes. So we used some uh, language parser. 
I didn't find one. Um, the, reducing the frequency and intensity of his seizures. The intensity of his seizures would be one, well, his seizures would be one phrase. The intensity of his seizures is another phrase. Frequency and intensity, right? I mean, so how do well, you... you take the long, longest one. Oh, you take the longest one. Yes. Okay. So, and it's more negative than positive. Treat that set is more positive than negative if you only consider the subject information. <laughs> And then, because these two methods, uh, among all these four approaches, they, these two achieve the best results, so we show the results here. But still, you can see, though our methods still can outperform the propagation-based approach, but the, uh, but the performance gain is much less, because this is really challenging, especially the uh, uh, epilepsy treatment from the post. And then we apply the expected sentence regressions to classify the sentences in the posts. So the pink line, uh, pink, pink, pink bar, it represents our approach. You can see it still outperforms all the other approaches based, uh, based on either the extraction, um, uh, expression extracted by propagation or the uh, general sentiment lexicon. So, but the stable performance of our approach on five very different data sets, cover different domains, different data sources, demonstrate that the, propos uh, the proposed approach is general, is generic approach. It's not, not limited to a specific domain or specific data sources. And here I show some um, sample output, so from the movie domain. So we can see that it can identify the other words, phrases, songs, and also can identify like something like Christ, cried a lot. Cried a lot is positive uh, about, about movies. Or like predictable is negative regarding movies. Okay. Uh, Lou, sorry, just a, a very quick question also on the comparison to the other um, uh, uh, methods. So do they use the same si uh, kind of uh, a seed uh, dictionary? I mean, you also have a seed dictionary, right? Sort of so, so do yes. the, the, the other methods have the same seed yes, dictionary yes. or do they yes. use sort of their dictionary? Very, very good question. So the propagation, that method also requires seed words. So we use the same set of seed words for the propagation and uh, our approach. But the other uh, general lexicon-based approach, they didn't use any seed. So because it's just a dictionary, like MPQA is only dictionary. So. And, and how, how, how big is their dictionary compared to your uh, seed set? So uh, the seed set only contains 230 uh, seed words. So that, that is like manually identified from the dictionary like, because they are domain independent. So it contains like 230 around. But, but their, the, the other dictionaries are much bigger. I mean, I just, just yes, make yes. sure. I mean, I, mean, I, I just yes. want to double check. So it's not that, that just you have a much bigger di sort of seed dictionary. That's not the case. It's the opposite, right? Your dictionary is much smaller, smaller but sort of more uh, generic, so to speak. Yes. So our dictionary is, is very small. Is it more smaller. generic or more targeted? Uh, so that one, uh, so the 230 uh, seed sentiment words, they are manually identified because they are have the have the character that they are do domain independent. Like excellent, right? The word excellent is positive in most of the context. So that's why I identify these things as the C sentence words. For but for other dictionary like MQA or sentence word now, they contain um, like MQA contain uh, eight thousand sentence words. Sentence word that contain even thirty thousand, I think. So Ingmar. Did I? Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. okay, then the next study. So still I want to show a, a, a application scenario. So Alice wanted to buy a new TV to watch Olympic Games. I'm thinking about that these days. So um, so he she went to the Amazon and to study these different products and uh, also trying to do the research by reading the reviews. But what she finds is that uh, there are too many products and too many reviews to read. So she's wondering it would be really helpful if they have a optimization, a aspect based opinion summarization for each TV product. If for each TV they have this kind of summarization, so the size of the TV has five stars. It has the feature big screen, perfect size, face big bedroom, and on um, picture quality it is five star or four stars. And the features including full HD, best picture, blur reduction. So. To support such opinion summarization, we need first some techniques to extract the features and aspects from product reviews. So it leads to the, this, this work, discovery of domain-specific features and aspects from product reviews. Especially we explore a problem that given a set of planned product reviews, how to efficiently identify features 
and us back. Um, so, can you just go back to the previous slide? So, is each row an aspect and uh, each small part the feature? Yes, yeah, so, so you can see these as features, like screen, uh, size, uh, big screen, because big, this word is about size. So, perfect size, about size, fit big parameter, about size. So, we want to define the, 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 the features like this and uh, group them as the stack size. So this is a paper published this year on Neko. And uh, here I also show an input and output of uh, the, the approach they want to develop. So given this plan review sentences, like phone is easy to use and it has great feature, large screen is great, great speed, makes smooth living of TV programs and sports. So from this one, we can identify uh, easy use features, like all these words as features, because um, like large is about the size of the screen and the screen. And you, you can see like for these non, non words, right, like uh, features of screen or speed, they are the opinion target. So they call them explicit features. For this right, uh, for this right uh, word like easy, large, smooth, they call it implicit feature because they imply they imply the feature like large imply its opinion about size, right? So we want to identify both the explicit and implicit feature and group them into aspects. Aspects can be represented as a group of features. So in this uh, output, we can see that um, right display screen these three features has been grouped together as a stack screen. Size, large, big, these three features has been extracted and grouped together to uh, represent the stack size. Yeah, actually I had some uh, questions regarding the way you classify explicit and implicit. Actually, I would like to regard uh, your explicit as the thing about which the implicit feature is talking about, it's like characteristic value pairs or attribute value pairs. Mm -hmm. So for example, processor is uh, uh, some a aspect or about which you can have fast or slow. Mm -hmm. And and so I actually I would have liked to have a conceptual model which was somewhat different from... So basically what you call yeah. explicit and implicit, I would like to consider it as a collection of pairs. Yes, I Where explicit is on one side and the implicit is the second half of the pair. Right, I didn't consider the, like, the structure of adding this one. But yes, I think it's a good point which can be explored in the future. So, the current existing um, studies do really take two step approach. They first identify features and then group them into um, a spec. So, there are two directions in the current study. Some studies they focus on uh, feature identification. They, group, uh, they identify features, but they don't group them. And they largely focus on implicit, explicit features, like the noun words, but they ignore the implicit features. And then a lot of mas uh, masters require C terms or label data patterns. So on the other hand, some other studies focus on uh, aspect discovery. So they assume that the features has been extracted by some other techniques all identified beforehand. They focus on grouping them. Group, grouping them. So they use either talk modeling based approach or classroom based approach. So the contribution of this work is that we propose a new classroom based approach that identifies both features and aspects simultaneously. We don't take two steps. And then extract both explicit and implicit features and group them into a stack. And it does not require C terms, patterns, or any labeling effort. So idea is here is very simple. So instead of chaining two steps, we combining them into a classic uh, clustering process. So here is the overview of the clustering algorithm. The algorithm take these things as input. First, X represent a set of candidate features. We extract noun and noun phrases as candidate of explicit features, adjectives and verbs as candidate implicit features. And, uh, and then we have some specific, uh, user-specific uh, parameters, like K. K is the number of aspects. And S, S is the number of most frequent um, uh, candidates that we want to cast them first. And uh, delta, delta is the upper bound of the distance of two merchable classes, uh, uh, clusters. I will explain them later. So we take these things as input, and output is the aspects 
as aspect clusters. We we can take all the features identified in the aspect clusters as the features. Okay. So the first three lines is initialization. And then from the first uh, fourth line to seventh line um, is the clustering, standard uh, hierarchical clustering. So in each iteration, uh, two closest clusters are identified and uh, merged together. But these two clusters has to be like uh, satisfy the constraint, like the delta has been like the distance to be less than the delta. And from a uh, eighth line to eleventh line, for the, all the remaining candidate, we find the closest seed cluster and merge the candidate into that cluster. But if we couldn't find any cluster that can uh, be merged with this candidate, we just make the candidate a single cluster. So I just want to mention a few key points here. The first key point is that instead of clustering all the candidates, we only select the top S most frequent ones to cluster them. Uh, the intuitive idea here is that first, the most frequent mentioned uh, features like screen, display, size, big, large, these things are mentioned frequently in reviews because they are the most important features of users' interest. So if we only cluster them, we can generate some high-quality seed clusters. And also we can speed up the process. We don't have to calculate all the pairwise um, uh, similarity or distance between the candidates. And then uh, the most important thing here is that we propose a domain-specific similarity measure. Like, when we try to find two closest clusters, we have this measure which determines how similar or how relevant these two, the members of these two clusters are in this particular domain or product. I will show examples later. So, but I will focus on this part. But if you look at this uh, whole clustering process, so after finished clustering, we will have some um, clusters, right? So we select the top K most frequent ones as the aspect. And then the features included in these clusters identified as features. Now I'll focus on the domain specific uh, similarity measure now. So if we want to measure the similarity between two terms uh, in product views, usually we have two different ways. The first way we can use general semantic similarity, which can be learned from dictionary like WordNet or web corpus. However, there's a weakness of this similarity measure, is that it, it cannot capture the domain dependent similarity. Things like ice cream sandwich, and operating system. In cell phone domain, ice cream sandwich refers to Android operating system. So both operating system and ice cream sandwich should be clustered together. But the if we're based on the general semantic similarity, we cannot capture that. So it's the weakness of the general semantic similarity. So if we want to identify the domain-dependent similarity, we have to use some domain-specific corpus and uh, identify this uh, distribution information, like statistical association between two candidates, like how frequent they call a car, uh, how, whether their contacts are similar to each other. Use this kind of information to predict whether they are similar or not. When, um, when you uh, unsupervise methods and you're trying to do that, how do they, how do they really um, understand this? How do they segregate the domains? So I'm saying this is cell phone domain and I'm looking at uh, similarity or clustering with regards to this in this domain versus something else. How does that happen? So, so in this case, right, like we can do either even for each of the product, specific product, like Samsung cell phone, mm. we can we can do this kind of clustering. But for the Samsung, uh, for the for the all the cell phone as a whole domain, we can also apply this technique. It totally uh, just depends on like what is the requirement of the application. No, so, uh, I'm just simply ask, uh -huh. I'm asking a general question uh -huh. in that. Uh, you have a very huge corpus, uh, right. you know, big companies uh, uh, would have access to a huge corpus. In their, in their case, how do they apply, um, you know, the unsupervised learning methods uh, whereby they actually um, are able to observe the relationship within the context, within the, uh, you know, domain. Here you have luxury of defining the domain, the right, right, right. domain. But if you just have a corpus, you don't have an idea of what domains that it captures, right? You just have the whole web kind of thing. So then what happens? Because Is there do. any idea? No, I, have, I have two answers. So one is either you have a separate classifier that <coughs> further fine grain does it, or the distributional semantics will hopefully, that similarity will hopefully reflect that because of the company that the word keeps. 
the point is that how do you recognize that there would there, there should be uh, <coughs> two different uh, measures uh, of ice cream sandwich participation? One is the food domain, other is the open system domain. So how would you recognize that there should be two of them? So, uh, no, but I, I think it's still the ice cream sandwich vector will yes. probably so the relate closer sandwich. to these two than the yes, other. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. You still can represent ice cream sandwich as the vector of its context. So if we compare like ice cream sandwich in the uh, southern domain, right, its context must, must be very different from the food domain. Hmm. The question is, do you know that, or is just uh, in the context of your use yeah. that will if the corpus is big enough, it will yes, happen. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, okay. However, we also find a weakness of this uh, this uh, this approach because we find that different aspects may share similar context, like display price speed. They all like can use this general sentiment uh, word like great. They there are three different aspects, but they share the similar context. And also, the words that describe the same aspect may not occur at all. Like people may say like this. A product is inexpensive or has great price, and I didn't say inexpensive price. So inexpensive and price, they don't occur. They don't even share the similar context. So using this domain dependent, uh, this uh, distributional information in domain dependent uh, corpus may not capture these cases. However, these cases can be easily captured by general semantic similarity. So it seems like these two gen uh, semantic similarity, they, 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 the measures complement each other. That's why we have the idea to integrate them. That's why we extract these two metrics, similar metrics, from the coppers. Uh, so we first have the general uh, similarity matrix G. So G is a n times n matrix. So each element G i j represents the general semantic similarity between two candidates x i and j. We use UMBC semantic similarity measure to get this G. And then for the statistical association metrics, we learn it from the domain specific coppers, like coppers about cell phone, coppers about higher dryer. So each element Tij is still a n times n matrix. Each element Tij is a pairwise statistical association uh, between candidate X, I, and G. We use the normalized uh, pointwise neutral information to measure this association. So after we have these two metrics, so now we can represent each candidate as a row vector in each the um, uh, in, in either the, the the matrix G or matrix T, if we represent both candidate X I and G, uh, X X I and X J as the row vector in matrix G, then we can calculate the cosine similarity. So this same G can capture semantically similar or relevant terms like screen display or speed fast. For the second one, we can also represent both candidate as a row vector in matrix T. So this can capture the words that are sharing similar context or co-occur, like ice cream sandwich and operating system. So the last one is the most interesting one. Because for some other cases, like smooth and speed, smooth and speed based only on general, uh, the matrix G, right, the semantic, uh, general semantic similarity, they are not similar. Also, based on the coppers, they don't really co-occur a lot. However, smooth co-occur with a lot with run running fast. And run running fast, they are similar to speed. So we want to capture this kind of uh, connection, which is like some some words that are strongly associated with smooth, they're similar to speed. So we represent one um, one candidate as the vector in G, one uh, one um, candidate as the vector in T. We calculate this sin G T. And then we use the weighted sum of these similarity metrics. And uh, we have this uh, WG, WT, WGT as the weight of these three similar measures. We use this to represent domain specific similarity. And the last one, uh, and then we conduct uh, experiments on three domains. The cell phone reviews are collected from uh, Samsung website. GPS and TV uh, reviews are, from, are collected from Amazon. And then we go, uh, build this gold standards by uh, manually identified aspects and features. We named our method as CAFE, clustering for aspect and feature extraction. And uh, we have some default um, parameter settings. We will study the effect of these, uh, um, of the influence of the uh, parameters later. So because our approach, the CAFE, 
can do both feature extraction and the stack discovery at the same time. So we evaluate this method on both tasks. We first compare these two strip art methods on feature extraction of the art booties strip art. So, so both of these methods, they are also unsupervised, but they require C terms. So one used the double propagation, the other one used prescribing. And they all use the, uh, the first one actually based on dependent relations, but the second one using also the uh, distributional information in the domain specific hoppers. So when you compare our results with others, so here we have like four versions of our approach, because the cafe is the one used the weighted sum of three symmetric metrics. So cafe G, cafe T, and cafe G using only the similarity G, sim G, sim T, and sim G. So, and then we do these experiments and evaluate the results based on prison requirement F score. So we can see that CAFE, our approach, outperform all the other, uh, all the two baselines in terms of uh, um, F measure, F score. But it seems like, if you want to look at this table, it seems like the require higher, uh, like uh, RT boot, uh, uh, pro uh, propagation of RT boot got higher record. But if you look at the prison recall curve here, so the blue line represents our approach. So red line represents the RRT boot. So because there's no parameter of the propagation, so there's only a single point. So we tune the, we change this um, parameter, parameters, we get this prisoner curve. Because the, our, the blue line, which represents our approach, lie always above the other approaches. It demonstrates the advantage of our approach. And then, we also evaluate our method compared with three um, state of art um, aspect discovery methods. The first one is a clustering method which use the mutual information, uh, mutual association between opinion words and features to group them. And LEM is a semi-supervised learning method that based on uh, expectation maximization. And LDA is also a uh, semi-supervised method based on type modeling. And these three methods focus on grouping features. So they ask for, they have, they need some other techniques to provide them the features. So we use both the RRT boot and our method to give them the features. And here are the results. So if we first look at, if we chain, chain two methods, like we chain RRT boot and the other feature grouping methods, and CAFE with the other three methods, you can see the, the, if we group, using CAFE to provide features always, uh, better than using our boot to provide the features. And our method alone can get better uh, classroom results in terms of run index compared with others. Our method do the feature extraction and the aspect discovery at the same time, so that it doesn't, any, doesn't need any other method to provide the features. So it clearly showed the, uh, the advantage of combining feature extraction and aspect discovery, then chaining them. And also the results suggested that the effect effectiveness of a domain-specific symmetric measure because IRT boot used only the uh, distribution information in domain-specific hoppers. It didn't use the general semantic similarity. But our, this domain-specific similar measure combined both. And then we study influence of the parameters. We first study the upper bound of distance, the delta. It's, we keep all the other uh, parameters at the default setting. And we change this uh, value of delta. And we uh, evaluate on both tasks. Like, we find that if we set delta to a value between 0 0.76 to 0 0.84, on all the others, all, all three domains, and both tasks achieve the best result. And again, we keep uh, changing S. S is the top, the, we select the uh, most frequent features to candidate to group them first. So if we change S, but keep other parameters fixed, we can see that um, if we first class from the top 10%, to 30% of the candidate, they can achieve the best results across three domains on both tasks. So last one, we changing the we keep changing the the weight of the same GT and keep the others fixed. We find that if we um, set WGT to 0 0.5 or 0 0.6, it can achieve the best results on all these uh, three domains across uh, these, these uh, both tasks. So. Uh, and then here are some sample output. I only select the five top um, uh, aspects from each data set. So we can see it can not only identify some of the clear, clearly of the, the, the aspects, like screen, battery of cell phone, 
uh, direction map of GPS. It can also capture something even I didn't notice when I looked at data, like detour. Detour is, detour is a important effect for GPS. So this approach identifies something like this, and also the glare for the TV. And then I'll just briefly summarize two applications. The first one is uh, uh, harnessing. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, just, 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 just before we go to the next mm -hmm. um, uh, um, uh, point, right? Sort of. So, so you, um, I mean, you, 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 you have very much emphasized uh, the, you know, the importance of the sort of domain um, dependence in, uh, in in all of this, right? And you yes. have this wonderful example of ice cream sandwich, etc. Sort of, sort of mm -hmm. like the, um, still as a. Um, as a baseline, sort of, or so uh, I, I wonder if it would make sense to some to have something that is global but has a lot more data set, right? So, for example, on the last slide where I interrupted you, sort of, or so um, some of those things, you know, look uh, sort of conceptually similar to word to vec or sort of other, um, you know, sort of embedding approach that, of course, not yes. domain uh, dependent, sort of, or so you know, that, that are trained on Wikipedia corpus or you know other sort of large uh, corpora, but. but um, I wonder, how, would there be any chance either to compare to those sort of like completely domain agnostic approaches, or would it be somehow possible to incorporate this sort of or so to a certain degree? This uh, goes back to the question that uh, Amit mean, has, right? Like if you had a way of identifying ambiguous terms, right? If, if some, some, something tells you, well, for ice cream sandwich you need a special treatment, but for other things you don't. Yes. Um, anyway, so I have a question sort of or so, is there like a way to compare it with something that doesn't, you know, it's not domain dependent, but has much more training data, basically? Yeah. So, for the first one, right, so, actually, when I build, when we try to identify the general semantics, uh, general similarity metrics, right, in this case, we can use the word embedding instead of the UMBC uh, semantic similarity. So for this one, we could definitely use word embedding, which can uh, learn from large co general corpus. So, so I think like this method is see we see it's a method, but it's actually of kind of a framework. So we can like we can replace replace the general similarity uh, general similarity measures with some other things like word embedding, like word to back. But we can also try other uh, other like uh, measures of the statistical association. But here in this uh, in this uh, in this um, Study, I didn't really compare with word embedding, but I think it's definitely a direction worth to explore. I, I, I have an intuition, then uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Okay? Well, I, I may be quite wrong also. I wanted to point out that word embedding produced in a situation like this aren't going to produce um, any of the dimensions in the embedding where you have a sentiment aspect come out as you know either a single embedding. Uh, it, it will not line up like that. So if you try to compare it, you're not going to get a certain aspect about which um, opinion is a, can be expressed by. That's not the natural sort of group that you get out of the different components in this sort of space. So, I mean, that's why uh, Lou said, you know, using the word embedding seems most appropriate in the word level similarity function and not as a way to cluster all the words together mm -hmm. um, for fundament based aspects. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, 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 correct me. Uh, see, see if my intuition goes somewhere uh, that is interesting. Um, if you are an application mm -hmm. is something like a search mm -hmm. and if you have any method like word embedding uh, you know which is trained on extremely large corpus diverse corpus mm -hmm. uh, the system will the, the algorithm will pick up the correlations across different dimensions uh, that these words are used in this context the ice cream sandwich is used in this context and there's We'll find other you know words uh, in that context, and based on your search uh, terms, you'll have used multiple search terms. We'll pick up the right context and use them. On the other hand, if you're doing a little bit more, what you what I might call information intensive tasks like review analysis, so reviews, then um, it's one thing to learn from the reviews of Amazon versus another thing to learn from 
reviews on Reddit or some other network. Right? So you, you, you probably, um, you, you're putting together every piece of data coming from diverse networks with different kind of interaction, different purpose that people have, different uh, reasons why people would be writing reviews. Uh, in Amazon review would be very different. I written some and I, I see the perspective that I would have used to share with the other users would be very different than the one I would uh, put my review on CNET or some other site where the products may also be discussed. And um, in the context then of uh, bringing out what a, a user or application would need, uh, I am uh, unclear whether, and I'm not quite sure, or I'm, I'm, I'm worried that the word embedding is learning from the very large corpus actually is a good service. Is actually going to be improving anything um, uh, because it is losing out on the uniqueness of uh, you know different medium on which uh, or, or platforms on which these reviews are discussed, the purpose for which they are discussed, the emphasis that uh, you know the reviews have on those aspects. You know my review on um, you know Reddit uh, would have a more of a technological aspects. My uh, you you know. Or reviews on uh, Amazon would have value aspect, may have a usability aspect, and things of that nature. Um, so um, um, you know, on on on. Uh, so 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 I'm not sure that everywhere you're going to benefit by using word embedding and what to vec rather kind of things. Am I right? Is uh, do you see this argument? I'm not sure. Mm. I think in this case, right, in this study, so I actually Justin and I, we considered word embedding at the beginning of this study. But later I find that clustering is like more flexible because we don't really require large coppers on each domain. Because in this case, right, like you, you, you mentioned it had different data sources, like Reddit or Amazon. But in this, in this here, we, we may have different product domains, like cell phone or hard drive. So, so if you want to do any word embedding, then maybe for each domain, we need a large coppers to train the word embedding. So, but in this case, they, they don't really require large coppers. We just need a small label data set and apply the clustering. The only in the general simulation metrics, this part can be trained on a large general coppers. But for this part, we just need a small domain specific coppers. So, I think this one is more flexible. But in, um, in the case you were mentioned, it, I think it's due. Um, No, I think maybe the way I look at it is uh, maybe the aspects, like for example, just think about what an expert or a connoisseur of some uh, domain would be interested in versus some some lay person or say high-end uh, audio equipment versus uh, low-end. So maybe the aspects that are of interest to one set of people different from that and maybe that is reflective the, 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 the of the point is to, place. The point is to understand... Um, whether um, learning from very large corpus is always useful or not. That, that, that decision depend, to recall kind of an issue. It depend on the application. Because to the extent that I am looking for search kind of application <laughs> on large corpus, it's clearly going to be useful that you have trained on large corpus and that it has picked up and it will save you all the time because it's all unsupervised and such. But when you uh, start to get more, um, you know, um, information incentive activity like review, that you're looking for much more specific, uh, you know, where um, uh, the system's understanding of the aspect or features would be, uh, product feature or aspects would be important. So it's a quality uh, of and, and very, you know, and where um, a product, for example, um, uh, the schema is there for most products. So I would rather use a schema than to say, hey, my system would have somehow learned um, in a schema-less kind of context, right? Pro, you know, if I look at a camera, then the camera, you know, sensor size is a very important uh, thing. And uh, if I were to today buy a camera, uh, you know, high-end camera, the only, the most important factor for me would be sensor size. For me, for, for, for a system where the schema information is provided, that there is a, you know, sensor size information, is, to me, still appears to be far superior than something where, hey, you say, well, 
the system will pick up whatever there is too low. Where, where among so much of the data, uh, only the recent reviews uh, and recent um, discussions will focus on um, only, and that also for the high-end camera would focus on um, uh, sensor size. And so many others would not have it, and hence the emphasis that I seek to have on the sensor size simply would not be picked up by the system. So I am arguing for the superiority of the systems where you are providing knowledge about the things that you are going to do, where you are providing schema information, where you are limiting the uh, you know, uh, flexibility uh, of uh, how you will do word associations. But the schemas aren't static. I mean certainly for cell phones and, and, and televisions the, the technology changes really quickly. No, I mean uh, the... Um, those schema evaluations uh, occur, but that is at a very, uh, you know, maybe in, in the once a year kind of level, not nothing much more than that. The the values keep on changing, but uh, you know, sensor size importance. I mean, uh, you would not find sensor size discussion on uh, uh, you know things that are five years and older, but in the last two years, you'll find a good bit of thing on sensor. So it kind of you know has stabilized. So uh, is the schema evaluations is very slow relatively compared to evolution on individual particular uh, values for the uh, properties or uh, features or uh, on data itself here. Yeah. When you say large corpus, you mean large heterogeneous corpus from these various resources? Well, I think is what the work is all done on the you know, large corpus, right? But is it, is it the heterogeneity of the corpus that is boring you when you talk well, about the different uh, when resources? You, when you have large corpus, uh, to create large corpus, you to any sources. No, okay, so, so let, let, let me take a different tack at maybe what you're suggesting. So when I, let's say if I'm buying some expensive uh, thing on Amazon, then I would read all the reviews, but I would probably uh, put more weight on some as opposed to the others. And and when we use these word web for some generic thing, all the documents basically get the same weight. And maybe that's what you, you, you feel is probably not appropriate across the board, I guess. I'm uh, I'm looking for in, in, in these days where everybody is moving towards you know very unreasonable effectiveness of you know mm. massive data yeah. set. I'm trying to say that there is a <laughs> value of human intelligence right. and no, but knowledge of a domain. Well, that's that's really ranking the that's thing. That's yeah. If we really want to use some larger corpus to learn something that we use as knowledge, right? So we can build, work, use, still use word embedding to learn something from large corpus, but I think the human supervision is doing important. Because if the knowledge has to be repeatedly used by some other applications, at least we use we need a human to validate that information. Right? See, the other point I want to make mostly for the students, current students, is that at least in the past, I have always uh, tried to clarify or sort of distinguish between the kind of applications and the choices of the computation you will choose, uh, uh, you know, cho in importance of models and domains of the center. So the search is the most um, simplest kind of application and uh, a, a one where uh, the search results are always looked at, are always used by the humans. And so the search results, um, because human brain is so powerful, uh, it is so good at picking out what is good. And really search result does not have to be, search systems does not have to be very accurate. Because human is a uh, you know willing participant in that whole process. From search, you go to integration, where um, you know um, that things have to be aligned, match uh, the right things have to con connect to each other, and thereby uh, whatever the computational understanding of the data is needs to be much more focused, much more uh, higher quality. From there on, you go to so-called analysis and then reasoning kind of stuff. Where, unless if the quality of metadata and quality of what you, you understood from the data is not good, you're going to go totally astray, uh, you know. So, uh, you know, there there is no human, very little human involvement. Anyway, we'll, uh, uh, I think uh, let, let going because of the time. <laughs> okay, I'll go quickly. So, and then third, uh, this application about like how we can harness public opinion on Twitter to predict the election results. Based on a study, how we can derive these opinions about election candidates and uh, whether the opinion holders matters when we predict election. So here is the overview of the system. From a user, his tweets and uh, on social network, we extract like for each tweet which candidate is mentioned and whether a positive negative opinion has been expressed about this candidate. 
and then we aggregate this information to predict which candidate this user support. And also based on this network and user user's description and the tweets, we can identify the user's category, like whether the user is right leaning or left leaning, and whether he's a high engagement or low engagement, or whether he posts more opinion or posts more information, etc. So and then after we categorize the users, we just group users into these groups based on the political preference, content type, engagement degree, and tweet mode. Then for each group, we aggregate opinions of the users in that group to predict the election results. So the so contribution of, of this work is that we introduce a method to predict the election results as I just explained. And then we show that, this is more important, show that opinion holders matters. Because here we study, we categorized opinion, uh, the, the opinion holders. So we show that opinion holders matter in predicting election results. We use the, uh, 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 we use the opinions from the different user group, examining the predictive power of each user group in predicting the Super Tuesday races in 10 states, uh, in 2012. And here we have some interesting findings. So first, when we compare, when we look at the engagement degree of, uh, of uh, different group users, Oh, okay. So here's the mean absolute error of the prediction. So we, we predict the results based on the 7 days, uh, 14 days, uh, 28 days uh, prior to the election using that way to predict the results. So if you look at the first one, so we can see that the high engagement users, if you use that uh, opinion from high engagement users, the error is low, which means but for the very low and low engagement users, the error rate is higher. Which means how you can identify the opinion about the silent majority, that is an important challenge. And then for the second one, we compare about the, user, uh, the users which post more original tweet or retweet more. We find the original tweet based prediction is better. So retweet may not necessarily reflect user's attitude. And then we also compare the users, like uh, which the users are opinion prone or information prone. We didn't really find a big uh, difference among these groups of users. So based on opinion information may not necessarily um, uh, uh, more accurate than based on the information. So the last, last finding is the most interesting one. Because we want to predict the uh, Republican primaries. So the opinions, if we make the prediction based on opinions from right-wing users, it achieved really good result. It correctly predict eight out of uh, 10 states, the winners. And also the, the error rate is less than 0.1. However, based on left-wing users, the results are much worse. So it suggests that because right-wing users, they are more likely representative, uh, representative to the opinion of their voters, right? So it shows, the results shows that the opinion holders matter when we predict election results. Do you think about primary here? Oh, yes, primary. <laughs> Yeah, but eventually, in any analysis that you do, you have to reflect one what one person, and then we need to consider the state. Uh, yes, based, the state. Yeah, uh, we use we use only from that state. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I actually ignore many details, but you can refer to the paper for the details. And the last uh, study. The, the interesting corollary, though, is that in spite of a reasonable insights like these, um, the commercial state of the art in election, uh, you. you uh, use of social media is still very, very basic and still they go for the right, popularity right. and the mentions as the only... Right. And the last one, we study the relationship between religion and subject well-being using Twitter data. So we study how we can measure the subject well-being using Twitter data and then how does religious beliefs of users affect the happiness expressed in tweets. So again, I, sh uh, I first show some overview. So for each user and the tweet in the social network, we identify that um, the happiness level, topic preference, word preference of each user. So we use top modeling here to get the topic, pre topic preference and word preference. So you can re refer to our paper too for the techniques we use here. And then uh, from the user side, we identify the user's self-reported religious beliefs. Like for this user, that is Buddhism. And then we aggregate measures of each individual users to get this uh, group level and measures. Like for the Bud uh, Buddhist. We get the happiness level, top preference, and the word preference. And then we study what is the effect of happiness and religion, uh, of religion on happiness. And also, how does the topic preference and word usage of each group affect 
the happiness expressed in peace. So the contribution of this work is that we provide a, a fresh perspective about happiness and religion. So because we, uh, unlike the traditional way that based on a self-reported, like in a survey, right, self-reported happiness, we analyze the topic and words naturally disclosed <laughs> in people's social media. Sorry? Yeah, I'm having the same problem that you had yesterday. Sorry, I didn't get. Oh, okay. okay. And then um, we introduce a framework that can be used to explore the effect of social and demographic factors of a holder on subjective well being. So here we focus on the religion, religious beliefs, right? But this same methodology can also be used for other factors like age or gender. And then our method. Not just simply trying to see like which group express more happiness. They actually explore so whether this ex happiness expression affected by the holder's topic preference and uh, usage of uh, words. They have some uh, many interesting findings, but please refer to our uh, uh, paper for this. So some general findings, is high level findings, is that there is a significant difference among these seven groups of users in. The ex uh, expressing uh, happiness in their tweets. And uh, each user group has a large difference uh, in, uh, on the topic preference. But the although, although there is one challenge, I, you know, is it all based on US? Yes, US. Yeah. So the point is that the, the happiness of uh, Muslims in US or um, uh, Jews in Israel uh, may be different than, uh, you know. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know. So, and also we find that the word usage is not that different compared with topic preference. And topic preference strongly correlate with their happiness expressed in tweets. So I can give an example here. So ACEs are found to be the least happy ones, like based on the tweets, like the emotions they express in their tweets. But we found that it correlates with their topic preference to like politics, human rights, uh, news. So because like human rights, top politics and uh, these things, this topic itself tends to be negative. <laughs> so that correlates with their whether why they request less like low level of happiness. Yeah. Right. Okay, so the conclusion of this dissertation, like I'll show that we propose this unified framework as these four components. And then we describe two new algorithms that can identify the same questions from social media posts and the opinion targets from product reviews uh, without asking for any labeling data. And then we show, like, briefly summarize that, like, a predicted election. Uh, okay. How we use this sub information to predict election results and uh, investigate the religion and the I want to announce a few uh, future direction. So I have a, like, a large framework here, but you can see only focus on this part, the sentiment, only the orange boxes, right? There are many things can be done here. So, for example, we can divide up some classification. Uh, methods to detect different types of subjectivity in text, like classify whether this text is about intent or emotion or sentiment or its preference. There is no such work currently. And then, because current studies still focus on sentiment and opinion, so like intent, emotion, preference, there are not many studies. So there are many things can be done there. Again, if you want to model the dynamics of uh, of uh, subject information, because people's attitude and emotions always keep changing. So how we can uh, monitor that, uh, how we can model that dynamics, they can add uh, another component, that is a time, in the framework we proposed before. So this is the uh, some future direction. And at last, I have to, I'd like to express some gratitude to, to all the people who have helped me a lot uh, in the last uh, almost six years. So, so first, I'd like to thank my amazing, amazing decision committee. So my advisor, Dr. Jeff, and uh, the rest of my committee, oh my god, they have helped me so much. I mean, I couldn't stand here without their help. So they inspired me a lot, helped me a lot, on all, all those facts, actually. So I don't know like, how to express it, but yeah, I deeply, deeply appreciate their help. And then the uh, other co-authors and collaborators. So I feel really, I feel like I'm blessed to have the chance to collaborate with so many amazing people. And the... I mean, I have learned a lot uh, from work with them. And then, of course, I'm so lucky to be a part of Noises, and um, 
I mean, this community gives me the, I mean, the best support system I can ever ask for as a PhD student. So I will always remember the wonderful time we spent together uh, last six years. Oh my god. <laughs> Every time I think about the six years, of, oh my god. <laughs> Finally, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think most of the people they have like they are very kind of familiar with my work. So yes, they are? Yes. Yes. No, I have a question. From your first work and second work, it's not so wise. So how do you know it's negative or positive or the combination is negative or positive? Oh, the first one I showed the optimization, optimization model, right? So, yeah, yeah. So, we know the connection between each pair of candidates. So, like, we know, like, good and very good that consistent, they have, they indicate the same polarity. Good and simple medic, a uh, simple medic, they indicate uh, opposite polarity. Good. Is positive. If we know good is positive, then we can refer uh, infer that very good is also positive. Simple my my data is negative. So that's so, positive you get from your dictionary. C C C, 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 like good. Yeah. So and yeah. then in the second one, like how do you distinguish features and aspect? Uh, aspect is a group of features. So basically, so how do you automatically extract them? So 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 the features. Can be automatically extracted, right? As an as like explicit or implicit. So features can also be nouns or words. Yes, yes. So that's why in this framework, right, we extract the noun and noun phrases as explicit features, adjectives and verbs as the implicit features. But we group them together, right? So the aspect is represented by a group of by a cluster of features. We call this one as a cluster. It doesn't really have a label. But we can give a label as a screen. Yeah. No, in the, in the topic modeling context, the aspect is like topic and word. Yeah, like, right, right. like labeling is manual labeling. No. Uh, no. For so because language. this cluster itself represents a, an aspect. So we can... Yeah, I mean, aspect in the summary you have to show that it's the screen, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. So in that case, we can use very simple method. Just pick the most frequent ones, most frequent now to represent it. So, so the only thing that you choose is the K? Yes, yes. Very nice work. Two questions. One a softball and one a little harder. <laughs> I expect that. Here's the, here's the softball. Um, on the product evaluation piece, you have uh, different levels of success depending upon the product. To what do you attribute that variability? So, so your F measures, you know, are better on some products and and and, and not and not as good on others. So GPS looks radar good, and cell phone is not as good, what's going on with that? Um, I think it really depends on the, the I mean, the data set itself. In some data set, so it might be harder to identify the features and aspect. I didn't really look into, actually one important thing I missed to mention here is that if you can look at our data set, we only focus on the electricity, like GPS, TV, or cell phone. We didn't really test on some other data set, like toothpaste, or some <laughs> skincare stuff. So it might be more harder, even harder on these data sets. Why? What, what's the, you know, what's governing this? Yeah, so here that the features, right, the features in some data sets, they are more obvious. Like screen or size, they are more ob obvious like on, uh, about cell phone, right? Or GPS is a directional map. People mention that a lot. But for something like toothpaste, so what kind of features you can expect in the reviews, mm. right? It's harder to identify. So more consistency in the, in the features. Right, right, right. Okay. It, yeah. So that was a softball. Here's a harder one. What in the world is an objective tweet? Or an objective anything? <laughs> it's like, I, I won't... You said 60%. 60% were you classified as objective and or something like that. And yes. 40% you said were not. So what's, what's objective? Okay. So here's a very simple example. A lot of people say that I'm going to... Like, I will watch the movie today with uh, my sisters. So... 
Yeah, this one even feel like intense, but something like <laughs> it's raining today, right? I was like, um, the 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 box box office revenue uh, revenue of this movie is something something. So this kind of information we take as objective because it does it's not really a factual. Yeah, mm-hmm. feel like factual. A, actual information. Yeah, well, the the rain one. I mean, there could be drizzle. There could be you know fog. There could, I mean, it, it, that that's worrisome. The uh, box office revenue that that strikes me as a, a measurable phenomenon. But even measurement has subjectivity in it, right? Yes. Like even rainfall. The, you know, we, we, we've talked about rainfall on hazard seas and how you know it depends on the directionality of the rain, whether or not the, the, the measurement is accurate. So I just start to worry about what it means to be objective. I think it's more like uh, if, if, if a thing is a fact, right? If it's a fact. Per- can- yeah. The person intends it to be, uh, you know, I mean, if, if the person says rainfall, it's a rainfall for that person. I mean, it's nothing well, yeah, subjective well, about it. In, in, in so reality, it will be... people report the same thing, right? I mean, right. I mean that is well, objective. So it's the consistency of the of, yeah. of the opinion that, that determines whether or not it's subjective? I think based on the definition, right, the objective um, means that things exist in the physical world or real world. Right. But physical. Yes. The subject information means that uh, the is is something exists in our minds. So everyone like it depends on different people. So is there facts needs to be validated? Yeah, that it's because some things is subjective. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, it's even the physical measure, like the rainfall measure. Mm-hmm. I mean, I thought that was as objective as it, as it could possibly be. And and oh, as you explained to me that you know it depends on the topography and it depends on the orientation of the rain and. You know, so even measurable physical phenomena yes. have some constraints and assumptions behind them that, that make them subjective in a certain sense. You know, it's, it's really interesting because even like different people may read the same tweet. They may someone may feel it's subjective, someone may feel it's objective. Yeah. Even this is subjective. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Ingmar and Justin, do you have other questions? Uh, no, I've already asked my question. Thank you very much. Oh, great. Thank you. Justin. I think Justin is very familiar with my work, so... Anybody wants to ask a question here? Oh, I'm, I'm very familiar with it. I don't have any questions that I want to ask right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, later. Maybe we can discuss it. So, um, uh, according to our procedure, we've excused the audience, and uh, now we'll have um, a, in a session with the candidate uh, for the committee members only. Good presentation, Lucha. See you. Thank you. Bye.